Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. Which you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a great Saturday. I'm a little bit late getting an episode out, but I found out yesterday that my dog Thunder who I've had for 13 years, almost 14, he is the last of the originals, has in-stage renal disease. So that was a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow. He's my buddy, and I know that dogs don't live forever. I wish they did. Anyway, so I've been doing some fluids, subcutaneous fluids under his skin, trying to get this dog to eat the renal diet because this, this dog does not like dog food by default. So trying to get him to eat this specialized diet, bit of a challenge. Anyway, so just send some good vibes to my fur baby. Hopefully, he'll respond and we can get a little more time with him, but I will not make him suffer. So if I see it's not working and he's getting worse, then me and him are going to have a heart to heart about what to do next. And I have a little bit of the thing going on with me right now. I go to the doctor Wednesday to kind of see what's up and what the next steps are. So send some some positive vibes my way. I'm very hopeful this is nothing and I can just keep on keeping on and go about my business without too much interruption. So yeah, yesterday was just a self-pity day. Today, I'm back. Feel better. And I realize that right now in this moment, I'm better than a lot of people in this world. And I'll take that and run with it all day long. Music fact of the day, Britney Spears. She's been in the news uh, this week because she is getting divorced. And I just want to give her a big old hug. So I looked up a fact about Britney Spears. She tried out for the Mickey Mouse Club when she was eight years old, but they turned her down saying she was too young. The second tryout was a success, and she joined the likes of Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, and Ryan Gosling on the show way back in 1993. A lot of familiar faces came out of that. And then, you know, I was watching full episodes of You Can't Do That on Television. I found a streaming service that has the entire show. I love that show when I was a kid. And I forgot Alanis Morissette was on there too, way back in the day. So I haven't done an episode since the press conference for Rachel Morin out of Maryland, the mother that was found murdered on the hiking trail up there. They received critical information this past Wednesday night, and it was a video from the LAPD showing who they believe to be the man who murdered Rachel leaving the scene of a home invasion. This was captured on doorbell video. There's no video of him going in, so I don't know if he went in a window. But during that home invasion, he assaulted a young child, is what we've been told. We don't know any details. And the authorities there in Maryland said it would be up to the LAPD to release more information. If you're on YouTube, I've got this picture up now. It's a back shot, but I tell you, somebody somewhere is going to recognize this guy's physique, his haircut. He kind of looked like he had like a boxer, they call it a cauliflower ear, and he kind of has some bow legs. So somebody's going to know this guy was in L.A. in March and in Maryland, at least in August, and bust this case wide open. But how they came to combine these two cases, they entered in DNA that was found at the crime scene involving Rachel in Dakotas, which we know is the National DNA Database. Well, that matched to this home invasion out of Los Angeles where the young girl was assaulted. Unfortunately, the suspect has not been positively identified. So clearly, this is not somebody who has had prior felonies. And my question is, how long has this person been doing this? You are doing a home invasion in Los Angeles. You're assaulting a child and then you're a prime suspect in the murder of Rachel. This guy's very fit. Uh, one of the alibiers on Twitter had a good point, which is maybe he met her at the gym or saw her at the gym because his physique was very toned and fit. And I thought that was a good point. I'm sure they're reviewing all the surveillance of where she was that day, probably showing this to employees there at the gym to at least see if it's somebody that looks familiar. He's five foot nine, 160 pounds, and he is of Hispanic descent. They kind of estimate him to be in his early to mid 20s. If you have any tips, the number is 410-836-7788. Or you can email tips R M as in Mary tips at hartfordsheriff.org. They believe the suspect acted alone and 
The sheriff said in light of this information, he urges citizens in the area to use caution walking on trails and in the community. Be alert, walk with a friend, don't be distracted by your cell phones or your headphones, and they're going to continue their heavy presence there on that Ma and Pa trail where Rachel was found inside of a drainage tunnel. There were some question and answers from that press conference that we're going to go through. When asked about the L.A. attack they said they're just referring that question to the LAPD. They won't give any details about Rachel's crime scene, obviously. He wants to ensure that they get the right suspect and that things that only law enforcement and the killer know are not made public. They think this was a random act of violence and probably someone Rachel didn't know. It's so scary, but that's really kind of the thought I had because... We went over a week without the boyfriend being arrested or anybody associated with her. I just felt like where this was done and the fact that it was done during the day in a park that's not isolated or abandoned. I mean, there were other people on this trail that this was a crime of opportunity as opposed to somebody that knew her and wanted her dead. There's just so many opportunities if it was somebody from her life to get her to be somewhere else that's not public. This person risked being caught in broad daylight. So that tells you how dangerous this person is. Let's hope that they find this man soon and get him off the streets. Clearly a danger to everybody in every state, not knowing where he is at the moment. Moving on to Corey Richens. Prosecutors will not seek the death penalty against Corey, who is charged with poisoning her husband, Eric, with fentanyl, as we know. That decision was made after consulting with Eric's family. So if she's convicted, it will be a life in prison sentence for her, most likely. And that's one case I'm really interested to see go to trial. There's a lot of trials coming up, I think, that are going to be interesting to follow. And that is one on my radar. Moving on to Brian Koberger. He had a big, big hearing yesterday. And I'll tell you, I saw a video of Kaylee's dad coming in and you see the toll this is taking on him. He just looks tired and exhausted and, and stressed, as I can't imagine what these victims' families deal with every single day. I feel so bad for these families, just what must go through their heads every day with the brutality of these murders and the fact that their kids were just normal college kids that were having a good time and doing what college kids do, which is stay out late, go to some parties, come home, go to sleep, and you never think that your kid would be the victim of such a terrible crime. The hearing yesterday focused on several issues, one of those being a request to delay the trial. Now, the judge denied the defense motion to delay the trial. Now, we know that trial will begin on October 2nd. Jury selection will be that week before. Super interested in this trial. And also, one of the big arguments is that the defense argued about the validity of the DNA that was found on the knife sheath that ultimately was linked to Brian Koberger through genealogy. And that's become a big topic in this case because the defense is worried that they did not follow proper protocol. You know, this is kind of a newer thing using genealogy databases to link suspects. In the past, it's been a lot more successful in like cold cases and things like that and solving decades old murders when you don't have a suspect, but you can build it through that network of these online genealogy sites like Ancestry. Some sites like 23andMe.com, they don't provide their information to law enforcement and you can opt out. But it's probably one of those things that like is hidden deep in the terms of service and what you're agreeing to. His attorney, Ann Taylor, told the court they have provided full DNA discovery for the knife sheath, but not the other three unidentified male DNA samples. I think that could be super hard because we know this was a party house. It seems like they had a lot of people in and out all the time. And I'm sure this was a nightmare for people that investigated the crime scene. You're looking for trace DNA. You're looking for hair. And this is a party house. So it really is such a big deal. But we, as we know, they found this knife sheath underneath one of the bodies and they went with that. And then they built this genealogy family tree, which ultimately led them to taking trash from Koberger's parents' house when he was there for Christmas vacation. And then linking it to Brian's dad, which essentially said the killer is his son. It's a little scary to me because if they would have used loopholes that are not following a uniform way to do this kind of stuff, if they were to lose that DNA, that would be a big, big deal. 
We don't know what else they have on Koberger. I'm I'm sure they have a lot more. But this DNA is huge because what are the odds that his DNA is on a knife sheath located under one of the victims at the crime scene? Prosecutors say they've given the defense everything they have. Prosecutor Bill Thompson said they've asked for DNA workups on other people to the extent that they don't have them. They weren't done. We can't produce something that doesn't exist. Earlier in the week, there was a filing relating to this DNA. This is the declaration of Gabriella Vargas. She is an investigative genetic genealogist, and the filing says the sole focus of the traditional law enforcement databases like CODIS is to compare crime scene DNA against the genetic profile for those who are known offenders with prior convictions. This process only utilizes 20 genetic markers and therefore limits the power of DNA analysis, which can and does lead to cases going cold. Investigative genetic genealogy combines advanced DNA testing with traditional genealogy research in an effort to identify a previously unknown DNA contributor in a family tree. The Department of Justice recommends that law enforcement seek out investigative genetic genealogy services only after all other investigative methods have been exhausted. It is widely known within my industry that many agencies use this technique as the first and only method. Chain of custody is best maintained when the requesting agency sends the crime scene DNA sample to a private lab that is capable of genotyping or whole genome sequencing. Once the sample arrives at the lab, the genealogist usually takes lead on the case until the person of interest is identified. The lab creates a genetic profile of the unknown DNA contributor and a raw data file containing hundreds of thousands of genetic markers is generated and then uploaded to the public direct-to-consumer DNA databases, GED match, and family tree DNA where autosomal comparisons are made between the subject and thousands of individuals who have voluntarily contributed their DNA profiles to the database and opted in to allow law enforcement matching. A list of matches who are biologically related to the subject is displayed with some basic identifying information and the amount of DNA shared between the individuals. I just had my 23andMe results returned to me, and it's insane. I have over 5,000 relatives that I'm related to through DNA. It's insane. I've already had two or three people reach out who were adopted and we're like third cousins, so it's really cool. I'm going to be talking to some of these people, try to give them some leads that might hopefully lead them to their birth parent. But we know in the family tree where we crossed. So it's it's amazing how this is solving cases, how it's bringing families back together and that kind of thing. But at the same time, I just hope and pray that they followed the right protocol when they were doing all this, because that DNA sample, if that's tossed, that would be a big, big deal. She goes on to say tools within the databases allow for further analysis of the DNA data and the ability to predict the most likely relationship between the match and the unknown DNA contributor. In-depth research on family history, structure, and DNA data alignment is conducted and family trees for each match are built back and then forward in time. I'm in the process of doing this right now and it's kind of tedious, but at the same time, you get on a lead and then you you get more hints. And so you're constantly getting new hints about your ancestors. It's, it's amazing. Kind of the twists and turns it takes you until you confirm this person is one of your great, 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 great grandparents. It's really cool stuff. Continuing on, these trees are analyzed by the genealogist for common ancestors, surnames, locations, and any other significant clues that provide insight into identifying the person of interest. Throughout the process, other tools can be used to further analyze Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Y DNA we get from our dads, mitochondrial we get from our moms. Ethnicity and multiple kit comparisons, triangulation, and chromosome segments. These database tools have known loopholes that allow a genealogist to see matches that have explicitly declined to participate in law enforcement matching. This is not a glitch in the programming caused by accident. It's a standard feature within the tools that essentially tricks the system into displaying all matches as opposed to only those who have consented to law enforcement matching. This is not a loophole, nor is it something you will stumble upon. Using the tool this way requires effort and knowledge. 
Databases for law enforcement cases require a fee be paid in order to upload that genetic profile. This is not the same for consumers who are not charged. Many in the field have been known to upload to these sites as a regular consumer to avoid paying the associated fee and to bypass having opted out matches. In addition, some databases restrict law enforcement uploading cases. However, that has not prevented it from happening. I'm aware that law enforcement has obtained results in ways prohibited by the terms of use and prohibited by their own policies. Most of the hearing was about the DNA yesterday. The defense called several experts to testify about DNA. They're calling into question how the DNA was tested. Did investigators use these loopholes to get the ancestry DNA that led to Brian Koberger? The state says it really just doesn't matter how they got to Brian Koberger. They say they've turned everything over to the defense. They also point out that a cheek swab from Brian Koberger matched the DNA on the knife sheath from the crime scene, confirming their methods with using the genealogy databases to build that family tree. The state also said that Koberger's cell phone data and his car led to his arrest. There are going to be more motions heard on September 22nd. That is actually right smack in the middle of Crime Con. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be looking at their phones during Crime Con. Jury selection starts on the 25th of September. A pre-trial conference will be held on September 29th. So I'm curious what you guys think. Do you think that they would have found Brian Koberger had he not left that sheath there at the crime scene? So let me know what you think. Curious to see. I think it's not knowing what they have or what they don't have. It's kind of a guess, but still, I'm, I'm interested to see what you guys think. I know a lot of people don't like the Daily Mail or don't find them credible. I love the Daily Mail, mainly because I'm a visual learner and they use a ton of pictures, so it's good for me. But they posted the pictures that Lindsay Shiver texted to her boyfriend Terrence and the alleged hitman Farron the day she said, kill him. It shows Robert with his arm around a woman on July 16th at the same bar that Terrence works at, which is her boyfriend. Sources told the Daily Mail that he was not on a date. It was a gathering for farewell drinks, and he joined at the last minute. I'm not sure if these photos set her off, but hey, look, pot kettle line to because She'd been going at it with this bartender way longer than it seems he filed for divorce. So in my opinion, they were long finished when these photos were taken. And it sounds like maybe she's jealous, but honey, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Remember, she's the one that has the boyfriend. We just did an episode on this a few days ago, but it's just funny because she really seems like, okay, we're getting divorced. I have a boyfriend, but I want the perks, the Bahama house, the private jet, all that stuff. And just think it's kind of interesting that these photos are what she texted when she said, kill him. This was also the day of that body cam footage. So a lot happened that day. They had the argument. He goes to the Bahamas and then she texts, kill him. That's another one I'm interested to watch because, you know, the 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 alleged hitman, Farron, his dad is a local politician. And I guess I'm just a little bit nervous that that could put a wrench in things. We will see. Moving on to Chris Watts. Wow, it's been five years since the murders of his wife and daughters. Five years in on a life sentence. He took a plea to avoid death, as you remember, and he was transferred from Colorado to Dodge Correctional Institution in Wisconsin after an incident in Colorado about a month into his sentence. They say now he works as a custodian inside the prison and largely keeps to himself. He talks to a lot of female pen pals, some of which still proclaim the man is innocent, even though he has described in graphic detail how he killed his wife and daughters. Sherilyn Cadle or Cattle, not sure of that pronunciation, she wrote a book based off of the letters that she and Chris exchanged over the course of a few years. He admitted to her in graphic detail how he killed his wife and kids, and she said he talked about it so nonchalantly. Chris has also grown close with a fellow inmate by the name of Dylan Tallman. They were in neighboring cells for the past four years off and on and actually self-published a book of prayers in 2021. The title of that was Revelation in the Reckoning. One of the prayers says, my past is a blueprint and the devil, the architect. While I watch his fallen ones build stone upon stone every day, I see these walls are insurmountable. A barrier that blocks me from enjoying your love, your peace, and your joy. Oh, Lord. 
You are my master builder. Help me walk around these walls, sound the trumpet, and shout that they may come crashing down like the walls of Jericho. I was looking up some stuff on him, and the most recent report I could find was from 2020, so it's a bit old, but back then it said motivation. Chris states, honestly, I'm still trying to piece it all together myself. The reporter says he is still trying to distance himself as much as he can right now from that moment. He states, in the last week or so before this happened, they never really slept in the same room or talked much, arguing about their relationship and it all came to a head. A lot of other things were said that they didn't mean to each other. For current attitude, he is not currently appealing the case. He's been told to appeal, but he's not in the right state of mind to do this right now. He doesn't want to make people go through that process for just two to three years. And I'm guessing two to three years off of a life sentence, not sure what that meant, but... He just wants to start the healing process right now, if that's even possible for him. In regards to his feelings towards the victims, he just kind of renewed his faith and talks to the victims through prayer. The victims are his family. What a sad sack, that one. So we're going to move on to some questions and answers from my contact in prison. The last email I got from her, apparently our emails are being flagged a bit because she's given me some insider information. So there have been some delays in getting her emails and vice versa, her getting mine. But the last one I got, our unit's ventilation system is messing up, sending us hot air, and it's been over 100 degrees all week. Somebody asked, if a newbie is tested to a physical confrontation, should they fight? She said, when newbies are tested, they should not fight unless all else fails. If they fight and lose, they are seen as prey. If they fight and win, there will always be somebody trying to beat them. She goes on to say that with sensitive cases, especially like Lori's, where it involves children, people will just beat them up just due to the nature of their case. Someone asked about the cell lights being on 24-7, and she said, cell lights are only constantly on in the reception yard. In general population, we have light switches. Six of us love the lights off and two in our cell always want it on. People were asking about the tablets. So Getting Out is the app that I use to communicate with her. It used to be JPay, but her prison moved over to this Getting Out. These Getting Out tablets are free for them, but they must pay per email, which is five cents. Movies for a month cost $2. A news app is 75 cents. And if they want music streaming, it's $6 a month. Someone asked, are there inmates that are just loved by everybody? She said, there's no absolutes in prison. Everyone has haters and people who love them. The worst, most conniving, predatorial prisoner sits with her friends and has a girlfriend. The most giving kind of inmate is someone who is patient and doesn't have a malicious bone in their body. But because of the nature of her case, she has haters who regularly curse her out. And she said, ultimately, human nature still rules in here. I had an alibi or ask about surprise paroles. And is it common? And she said, surprise paroles absolutely happens. My friend who had been here 18 years got pulled into a Zoom court last Monday and they paroled her Friday. Last year, several lifers and a life without parole had the same thing happen. Laws change and people go home. Another question from an alibi or do you see women who sabotage their release dates because they're more comfortable on the inside? She said, yes, sadly, I know quite a few inmates who have chosen to stay here by refusing to go to their parole hearings. They get written up frequently, so they will be denied parole or they'll do something to pick up new charges to extend their stay. A lot of these people, she said, are institutionalized in and out since they were juveniles. And we heard that the most common age there where she's at is 19 when you get your life without parole sentence. It's just so sad. And I think the, the sad thing to me is not that they're paying for their crimes, but the fact that if you go way back, according to my contact, a lot of these women have been viciously abused since very early childhood and didn't know they were victims. And it's not an excuse, but you do see how maybe that contributes because that is a common problem. Untreated mental illness, people who have not gotten counseling for abuse they endured from early ages on and then not even knowing that they were victims until they were grown women and in prison. It's sad, it's scary, and it's a cycle. And I don't know how we break that cycle, but something's got to change, y'all. Somebody asked, is there anything that you look forward to? She said, we look forward to our July 4th meal 
Bill Glass has a prison ministry event there once a year that the inmates love. Christmas gift bag distribution. They have a gospel fest and banquets or yard events. Somebody asked about death row being nicer as far as having a bigger cell. Death row is a single cell, but it's not bigger than the ones in general population. But I guess if you think about it, they have eight per cell in general population. Death row is in the same building as their segregation. And the building is also a twin to a general population unit in the reception yard. So it doesn't sound like it's much different than what's in general population, just that you get a solo cell. Somebody asked about Lori and would she be instructed by a group or staff about how to acclimate socially? And she said, nope, she won't be given any help. That's something she will have to learn on her own. Baptism by fire. Banquets are catered events where they can celebrate their group or their job. They're planning one for their construction program to celebrate the completion of multiple projects. Since they do not have outside sponsors, they will organize and fund it themselves. It costs about five to $800 for all the food in the gift bags. They are allowed four items in each gift bag. We hope for clear backpacks, flip-flops, academic planners, and water bottles. The problem they often run into is that they need 40 of each item. The food typically comes from Costco, but Costco doesn't do direct sponsorships. So they had hoped Costco would send them donuts, pizza, cheesecake, wings and chips, snow cones, syrup, popcorn for the machine and cotton candy sugars and random snacks for the banquet is kind of what they aim to have available when they do have these banquets. They also have a unit banquet since they are an incentive dorm. So where she's at, because she's had no write-ups or any disciplinary problems really since she's been in from what I've been told, rules are a little bit more lax there where she is. But at the same time, they're not immune there from the same prison drama that you see and hear about every day in just a general population. She said Christmas bags are collected by different organizations and they include sample size hygiene products, a toothbrush, greeting cards, packets of hot cocoa, a pen, a packet of Kleenex, an emery board, and chapstick. Several times a year, they can receive up to three items donated since they are a programming unit. So far, it's only happened at Christmas. A girl's family donated hair ties, chapstick, and body spray for all. Donations must have 200 of each item in them, so everybody in the building can have one. Their building can also receive donations of books and DVDs. Anytime donations arrive, she said it's super exciting for the inmates. They look for their favorite books and movies as the tablet content is very limited. The 4th of July event is something they look forward to. They get a hamburger and a hot link meal plus watermelon and they get to eat picnic style out in the yard. She said there's music and games and everybody just kind of leaves prison behind for a little while and they just have fun. Gospel Fest is like a camp meeting with choirs and speakers. So somebody asked what are some of her favorite prison hacks personally. Her favorite food prison hack is turning ramen soups into chow mein. She's going to give me that recipe whenever they push through her emails to me. And she said using the three inch flat iron as a toaster, they use it for toast, quesadillas and more. Another prison hack they do, making full fledged decorations out of cardboard and paint. She said that they have a Mickey Mouse theme room in the cell she's in with homemade posters. She said they use cardboard to make little tiny drawer sets, organization boxes, shelves for our lockers and more. Girls use rubber bands to turn up the hem of their pants. To cook, they use a small plastic trash bag. And we went through this in a prior episode, but they suspend the bags of food in water that's boiling thanks to immersion heaters. And they make full meals this way. The use of sanitary napkins to clean, make shoe inserts, or another good hack. They use sheets and a net bag to make hammocks, organizers, backpacks, handbags, shoe hammocks, etc. Binder clips are used for holding towels on bars to dry. Close up food bags so they don't spill. They reuse product containers for storage. They also make body spray or air freshener by pouring watered down laundry detergent or body wash into a spray bottle. They use a white piece of paper inside a sheet protector to make a dry erase board to communicate to rooms across the hall. I asked her about any special memories that stick out to her 
over the course of the 12, 13 years she's been in. She said, my special memories are watching my friends graduate to be a dog trainer in the puppy program. Having a creative friend make me a happy meal for my birthday through friends working in the kitchens. Seeing my friend graduate college. Having an officer dance to make me laugh when I was on the verge of tears. Having a chaplain risk losing their job to give me a hug when it was really needed. A surprise extra quarterly box to stock up on treats during the pandemic. Having a boss say they would hire me when I'm released. Or having prison staff say I'd be welcome in their home as soon as I'm off parole. A new free world staff who shook my hand before they knew they were not allowed to. Lifers offering me clothes my first week in general population. Friends sharing sale items when I couldn't afford it myself. Having a job that makes you feel normal. Family style meals in the room. Random acts and words of kindness from officers and staff go a long way. Telling family that now their phone calls are free and her first video call seeing her parents. So there's a few of your questions answered from my person on the inside. She has got me in contact with two women, one who is currently on death row, one who just got off a of death row. So I'm able to communicate with them as well as my contact to get a little bit of different insight. I really want to dive into death row and what it's like to live decades. This woman that just got off had been on the row for 30 years. The one that's currently on there, I definitely want to ask questions. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask my contact, you can send me an email, gg at prettyliesandalibis.net. It's kind of a fluid situation as to how quickly her emails get pushed to me and mine to her. But I'm going to keep this going on because there's not a shortage of content and there are a lot of different ways we can take this. I think a lot of you guys, as I am, it's fascinating to hear about what it's like to be a prisoner and to live that life 24-7, and especially with lifers knowing that the reality is that is the rest of your life. On the next episode, I'm going to do a huge backstory on the Jared Bradigan case. He was a former Microsoft executive who was gunned down with his two-year-old daughter in the car. She was unharmed. His ex-wife was just arrested this week. She is the third person arrested in his murder. Earlier this year, there were two people that were arrested, one being her husband, her current husband, and an associate of his who admitted to being the trigger man. He's flipped, going to talk about the both of them, but she was just arrested. This man was murdered in February of last year. Very sad story. Man, he seemed like a great father. And it's an interesting case that I really want to follow. It's busted open again with her arrest this week. Her parents own a very successful paper product company. It kind of reminds me of a multi-level marketing company where they have people under them who sell and then they get that commission and all that jazz. But anyways, so that's going to be the next episode. Maybe some more of these prison Q&As as they come in. Appreciate you hanging out with me. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day. We will see you soon.